you're going to have to let people go, but hopefully not because the business completely has to change. Um, hopefully it's for other reasons. Uh, and, and when people bet on you, uh, you owe them, you feel like you fell to them, right? Like mm-hmm. that's kind of to your point of like, when that business didn't work, it's people that decided to choose you over all their opportunities and it didn't pan out. So that was the hardest part, I would say. Welcome to Beyond the File, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. We're joined today by Andreas Claric, a founder with many years of experience in the investment space. He started a career in Wall Street, investing in tech and business services across the globe and working with giants such as Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse. He's since co-founded Fuse, a disruptive tech company in the finance space, which has recently raised $10 million in investment funding and their support from a few large corporates, including Barclays Bank. On today's episode, Andreas shares the difficult business decision he had to make, closing down the business he was so passionate about with ties to his childhood and ultimately pivoting to his new business, Fuse. He discusses how he approached what he described as the hardest moment, having to lay off staff in the restructure that followed. Plus, he also shares how he convinced his investors to stay on and continue to invest in the second business. He also talks about growing up in Bolivia and the resilience that being a foreigner into a new country can give you in business and the advantages that that grit and determination can bring. Andreas is very philosophical. He's got some great analogies that I know you're going to enjoy. So strap yourselves in because this is Beyond the Fail with Andreas Cleric. Andreas, thanks for being here and for joining the podcast today. Really excited for this conversation. So I'm curious, Andreas, did you come from a family of entrepreneurs at all? I, I wouldn't describe them necessarily as like purebred entrepreneurs i think that they've uh they've done a a number of things that could be labeled as uh on the fringes or like pure entrepreneurial stuff but they've they've also had corporate jobs right my my grandfather has 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 done both my dad has mostly uh, done like just corporate jobs but i think like from the moment he uh, migrated here to the u.s that that in itself restarting a career uh starting from no with no network and things like that I think in itself, that is some, uh, I, I would say an even more brave version of entrepreneurship because it's just really starting nowhere. I think immigrants in a way are micro entrepreneurs. And, uh, I, the two of those examples probably translated into, uh, uh, igniting that flame and curiosity for, for, for entrepreneurship as a whole. That's an interesting phrase you used that, uh, you know, um, you see immigrants as micro entrepreneurs. Do you want to elaborate a little bit? I thought that was an interesting, um, yeah, kind of concept. I mean, they definitely, uh, they're a little bit of dreamers, right? They, they kind of like pursue, try to go somewhere else, finding a better, uh, because they think they have better opportunities elsewhere, right? And I think entrepreneurs just kind of start like that, or they have an idea that they really believe in, uh, and that they want to execute on, right? And they think that they can make it happen. Uh, it's a little bit of dreaming component, and it's it's grounded in like both our and some rational, but um, obviously, like uh, you're just you first depending on how you migrate to it, you know, it could actually be very risky too. Yeah, which is obviously like an entrepreneur, right? Taking taking risks, yeah. dreaming, dreaming big. Yeah, yeah. So, what influence do you think that's had on you? I think that, uh, I mean, as an immigrant is more, just seeing my parent, uh, my father, my father being able to like, uh, do the things that he has done kind of makes it to me the way that I see it is I think it can make it a, I have way more opportunity. He, he turned himself into powder to make bread, right? Like, and, and, and that 
I have the opportunity today to first benefit from that. And second, uh, he had dreams and I, he has allowed me to have bigger dreams, different dreams, right? It's not that he's like extrapolating his dreams into mine, but uh, he definitely did not have the same set of opportunities that I do have today. But without his help uh, and my mother and like the rest of the family, I would have not gotten where we are today. So it's it's the sum of efforts, right? And and, and I, I it, it's quite often the case that I think uh, the U.S. in particular, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's a pretty it's an amazing uh, uh, place to actually start something new, like to start a new life, to start a new business. I mean. It, there's there is a ton of stats around like just the percentage of unicorns and decorators in the U.S. that are founded by immigrants, right? Like you can you can just make an entire thesis around investing in in folks that like have certain schools of, on top of that uh, sons or daughters of immigrants, and like there's it, it just shows some grit around it, right? Like, I guess you you have a chip on your shoulder. Not not sure necessarily what the the science on it. I just read kind of more like the headline. Yeah, so you think, I think you're probably right. Thinking about it, it's like those people have had to come through difficulty and challenge in their life, which has, as you said, has given them that resilience and that grit to then cope with the challenges of of creating large businesses. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that you kind of uh, minimize all the other issues. I- building a business just doesn't seem as hard as all the things they might have overcome before, right? Or like failing, uh, it's, it, you have a, a much, you realize that like just things get, that you can, you can overcome things, right? Like, and, and I think that if you've never gone through the tribulations of like perhaps having to make a decision or back up and leave, uh, you've never encountered hardship, right? And it just a little bit harder. And you don't need to necessarily go through that, right? Like there's no, there, there's a saying that says that like this, uh, smart people learn from their mistake and like geniuses learn from other mistakes. But I think most people fall into the ones that kind of like learn from their own mistakes. Uh, not everyone is lucky enough to like just look at other people's mistakes and learn. So since we're more talking about the law of large numbers, in general, we learn just from our mistakes. I think, um, yeah, I think what I was going to ask was, was, was an interesting one, which is... Um, how gritty would you describe yourself given what you've kind of experienced in your life thus far? And do you like resonate with those leaders that we just talking about, those founders um, who, you know, have, have founded unicorn companies that are immigrants and how, how similar do you see yourselves to those? I mean, I like the, I, I, I like the statistics, the statistics, right? Like it's not because I'm an immigrant, I, and it's, but it's it just a nice, it's a nice, uh, uh, extra, uh, co- component of the, to the stats that I, I, I'll take it, right? I think that there's also, uh, which area, what type of schools you went to, what, what genetics, like so many other things, how healthy you are, how young you are, what age, uh, what, what type of jobs you had before, but I do think that uh, it shapes you. It, it does shape you knowing that um, that even the I will, uh, the, that everything is going to be fine and that you'll find a way, right? The same way your parents found a way, you'll find a way in this business, you'll find a way in, in your business career, uh, in your life and everything, right? Just you you don't get into like, I would, yeah, you, you're, you're a little more optimistic than average, which which is a good thing. For t- because you, you're going to need a lot of optimism if you're trying to perform a brain surgery while the plane is falling out. <laughs> That's essentially what building a business is. Yeah, no, I've not heard the brain surgery one. I've heard it's like, you know, the, yeah. I think um, Reid Hoffman from LinkedIn describes it as jumping out of the plane without a parachute on. But I think um, the brain surgery one's probably even more extreme than that. It's probably even more accurate than that. I mean, yeah, the odds are against you, right? Like, definitely, uh, but you can just, talk about that that those odds are against you in every single thing right like someone applying for like i don't know a top school in the u.s still faces like a 10 percent chance of getting in uh someone applying for a top job it's along the lines it, like you will have those against the odds uh with your partners with your love life and everything right it, it's a, it, it's very few things 
uh, that are worth it, but like I have 90, 95% approval, right? So the same thing, uh, uh, I think applies for business. No, definitely. I was just thinking even the human race is, um, or even being born is, you know, against the odds. Yeah. And that's like infinitesimal. <laughs> I've heard you say before that you also got inspiration from your grandfather. You said he was kind of quite entrepreneurial. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, he has he has had a couple of businesses in the past, uh, uh, all over the spectrum, and he, I, I would say like what I more than his business acumen, I always uh, he's the type of guy that will always just never take a good, the question seriously. He will always laugh. And and I I mean I think it's probably hard to have that as your dad, but as a grandfather and in the context of business, it's it's just the guy that like he can, he can actually be very uh, it's very pleasing to be around him, right? So I I I I imagine that a lot of the things that have helped him succeed is the fact that at the very ground level he can connect with folks, and that but at the end of the day people don't follow ideas or they do follow leaders right like just someone that i can actually inspire them and make them believe that this is worth doing right because if you're musk and you're trying to make a rocket the first thing you are you're just the idea is good but it's also like musk needs to convince you like let's make a rocket right or like whoever created the, the vaccines for covid it's not only there's a mission component but it's also like i really believe that these folks are the ones that are going to do it and i want to work with them um you can talk about coaches and, and sports and all that. It really, it really, wh why is it that like uh, Manchester City with, with the same players didn't win that as much and then they put Guardiola and like they start playing much better, right? It just the leaders really help. No, completely. And is that, and it's interesting you described your grandfather as a leader. Is that something you recognize at an early age? Would you describe him as a, as kind of one of your first mentors? I don't say probably my dad is more of a mentor, but I do recognize that that uh, that my grandfather has a much better outlook on how he sees the world and how relaxed he approaches problems, right? And and my, my dad is much more alert, kind of like just trying to really well micromanage everything and they're very detail oriented. My grandpa is much more like, hey, like this is the big picture and just let. let the, it, and I, th I, I think you need both in life. Uh, Business as well, right? Since you asked me, yeah, exactly. But since you asked me about my grandfather, I think that the, that was my answer about my grandfather. And um, I've also heard you say that he was a race car driver. Yeah. And but this is like the 1950s, right? Like he would race, uh, uh, it's mostly like rallies, right? Like I actually was speaking with him uh, a few days ago and I asked him like, what was kind of the safety in those cars? And like, there's nothing. Not, like yeah. that you didn't wear a helmet like <laughs> with the first thing i thought is like how heavy was the car like what 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 would they have the cage around you and there's nothing none of those days you just raced <laughs> like, like have you seen the formula ones of the 50s like they were like coffins pretty much well probably quite literally at times yeah yeah quite literally yeah and what um because obviously, you know, I'm thinking ahead, you know, thinking about that was, uh, you know, he was obviously into kind of adrenaline and and seeking out thrills and things. Is, is that something that has been passed on to you? Uh, you know, is starting a business in some ways like an adrenaline ride, right? Yeah. No, I, I love motorsports. Like, I'm I'm obsessed with Formula One uh, since I was a little kid, right? Like, if anything, if I have to... If I have to describe like my my heroes growing up were like astronauts and like Formula One drivers. I like I, I don't remember when I, 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 I might have been my five six years old, right? And when when Senna died, I remember that clearly. I was watching that race, right? And watching or seeing like your childhood hero died in front of you at nine a.m. I guess nine a.m. my time or eight a.m. whatever that time was in South America uh, in Imola, watching that race just kill my dreams right i remember thinking i definitely do not want to be a formula driver now but but it, it, it's uh it, it's, it's the sport that i follow with passion right and, uh, and and i and that was passed through my dad right my dad probably like through my grandfather got me into motorsports um i had the chance to be in a formula one before i was not driving it but 
uh, at least I got to feel the speed of it and see that one of the best experiences I had in my life. Yeah. Uh, I also remember that, that incident of, of, so dying it's one of those where were you kind of moments i think um if you're into you know into to sports so what was your kind of journey into starting your own business uh first i started as a i i, I started like just as a banker right and my first job my my first job out of college was uh, as an investment banker in new york, new york city um the type of, of businesses that i was covering at that point where insurance asset managers banks i did that for two years and i think i, I went into banking knowing that it will be like a two or three year thing that's a very common approach of folks that like will go into wall street in the u.s I, probably the same thing in the uk uh with the idea that uh, afterwards i will uh go into an uh an investing role and that i was lucky enough that 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 happened um i uh I went into like uh, an, a, a, an investing role. I was investing in, in assets in Latin America and Australia. So I spent a lot of time between the US, Oceania and like South America. And then I went to Harvard for my MBA. Um, I, I met my co-founder there. But at that point, we didn't really start the business. I just went back into like investing after the MBA. And uh, after four, year, four or five years of doing that, I decided to like start something. I could, I had the itch and desire, desire to start a business. And that's kind of how the origin story, how I ended up, uh, like just leaving the corporate world. Uh, the original idea that we looked into was a consumer lending broker. So like we will sell loans to banks, credit unions, to finance companies. We will have the acquisition funnel through TikTok and Facebook. And, uh, we had built an entire processing engine for those loans to be pro uh, closed and uh, funded. And all the lenders that we were working with approached us and they were like, hey guys, this is pretty interesting what you've built. May we ask, can we ask who are your the, the tech vendors behind your stack, right? And we were like, well, we actually have built most of this internally. And that triggered a conversation on them buying technology for months versus actually just buying loans. So that's kind of we, how we ended up in the business we are today. We, it was just uh, one thing led to another. And afterwards, we just never looked back. We raised over 10 million bucks of capital. Um, we're s serving banks, credit unions, finance companies here in the U.S. And we started from like a focus on auto to a bunch of uh, other new categories. But it, it, it was not easy, right? Like you started something thinking I'm going to build, like, I don't know, the new uh, auto lender in the U.S. And then you realize what you've built is a technology business. And you need to convince yourself as founders that that's the right path. You need to convince your investors that that's the right path. Employees, stakeholders. I think I'm just uh, summarizing something that happened for months, not necessarily in like <laughs> two minutes. Yeah. And before we get into some of that and unpack, you know, some of that change, I'm just interested to, uh, I suppose, firstly, why you decided to do an MBA did you have desires to start your own business then what was yeah what was the motivation for doing that MBA I think it, it's most folks in the, the investing world end up doing an MBA so it was a natural path for me it uh, opens a new set of doors and and th that was kind of the rationale right like I I, I would say if, if I, I knew that if I wanted to build a business and things like that, it would be a good accelerator to meet people that think alike. Um, and I, you're just younger, right? You're in your twenties. I think that you're still accumulating optionality, which at some point optionality is useless unless you actually act on your options. So it was still in that mindset of optionality, right? And I, I would say that as you get older, you don't care about the options. You just care about acting on, on that and then committing. So I think that's kind of uh, that part, second part of, or like most of the journey in life is no, no more optionality and just more making decisions and getting paid to do that. And why didn't you start a business kind of earlier? Why did you, you know, 
I spent essentially going to industry and doing MBA? I stood alone. So, I mean, like just being super pragmatic, right? Like in the US, it's college is expensive. Um, that's one, that was one driver. Second was, I mean, I, I just didn't necessarily feel that my, my abilities were up to task to like what you would need to really achieve uh, to live. To increase your chance of success, that doesn't mean that you're still you're going to succeed. But you, if you can add a a few percentage points to that, kind of similar to the analogy of immigrants, uh, if you can actually, and, and if you actually have control over those, um, I I thought it was important to kind of learn from places that they have where they have processes or they have proven uh, toolkits that you can acquire and that they they stay with you for life, right? So. Working at a bank, I knew I will work horrible hours, perhaps, but I will get it in, in two years. I will get the experience of like w- w- in, that a lot of people take four, five, six years to, to accumulate, right? Like you're working a lot of hours, right? So you're getting that very fast, very compressed. Uh, and the, I, I thought that getting the toolkit of an investor, kind of learning a, uh, about a lot of things, but kind of more like surface level was something that was interesting to me just to kind of to borrow the analogy of the hedgehog and the fox i want early in my career i wanted to be a fox right i I just wanted to know have very broad knowledge uh, about a a lot of things not necessarily very deep uh and once you start a business you become the hedgehog right you just know a lot about this one thing that you do and uh, and in, 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 it's an adaptation process from a style standpoint, right? Like if you're a very curious person, like follow planning, like your entire obsession because one thing, right? Like you are not reading Russian novels anymore. <laughs> like you're, just, or maybe you are, but just not at the same level than what, what that you had when you were like much more broad and, and focused. Yeah, it's that. Uh, I suppose it's that niche down and becoming a, an expert rather than you know uh, essentially a. A, a general yeah. of all trades, but um, yeah, I love the hedgehog uh, fox analogy. So, this this kind of pivot that you made in in your business, what, over what kind of time period? What was that? Uh, the pivot was in uh, twenty twenty one. So no, sorry, twenty twenty two. Most of most of twenty twenty two, we 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 spent it on this, like, uh, and. It, it was a quick realization, right? Like, uh, of course, like first you have hunch, then you look at the numbers, then you look at the set of opportunities, then you realize, like, oh my god, like the our customers, like we might we might have we might have been very excited about this thing, but everything is showing us that like th- the facts are here, right? And and if you want to build a business going to be out there's going to be last you and that you're going to be very proud of you can go either way but the, the high likelihood of success is here like do not ignore the facts that I like, and the facts showed us that, that we should actually become a b2b business and the and the customers were telling us right that you just felt that it, in your guts right it was strong the pull so of course, you have investors at that point already, right? So it's not that you're like, "Hey, guys, we change our heart. We're doing this." It's you need to say, "This is why we're doing it." This, in, essentially, like you need to pitch to them again to earn the right to keep their, their their them as investors, right? Like that is fundamental. Then you need to make tough decisions because not everyone in the team, in, in, you have in, in, in that team composition, is going to be the right fit uh, for that journey, right? So you need to kind of uh, let people go uh, and and re- re- have a recomposition of the team, right? Like even if you end up having more employees, it's just going to be positioned to a different type of uh, business model. Did you have to let people go? Is that what you kind of did? Yeah, that that had to happen, right? You have to restructure the business, right? You become a much more engineering focused business. Essentially, you're instead of selling uh, an operationals uh, component, you're like a marketing play. You're all, all of a sudden become an engineering uh, play, and you're uh, engineer. You go from an organization that it's full of operators, where folks that are like doing calls and things like that, to an organization that's engineers, and that in itself re- requires like uh, 
an entire conversation around like leadership and things like who who what falls in uh, the hands of who within like the founding team and that that was uh it's kind of like renewing your vows in a marriage right you need to fall in love again uh and i would say like hey like i still love you and i'm super excited about what we're what we're gonna build together and what did you find most difficult during this kind of pivot uh, i think that what i would have found more the most difficult and i think like a lot of founders told us is had we not set a timeline for a decision to be made right like because Otherwise, like you can be in, inf- in an infinite timeline of like, hey, let's um, let's uh, let, let's figure it out. Let's be very kind of careful and thoughtful. And this this type of decisions don't come overnight. Yes, they do not come overnight, but you don't need years. Either, right? So it, it, time is a time is a precious uh, resource. So um, make sure that like you do you use that time accordingly, right? So. We set a we set ourselves like a, a two or three month timeline to like actually l- look at the idea and see if, if we're gonna, if we're going to change the course of the business, we might as well just look at the entire playing field, and if we're ignoring other larger opportunities, and it, it was it, from the very beginning it felt clear that it was going to be what what we were done today, but we still went through like a pretty honest process of like hey like let's look at all this options. you basically and, started again in some ways right you start you started considering all the different options to start again exactly because first you need to be honest with yourself and second like your investors all you owe them an explanation at the very least right and, and kind of show them hey like it's not that we change switch for a from b to b before deciding on b we looked at the entire alphabet of options then like we uh, narrow down to like this subset of options. We did this, uh, and like, and this is kind of what surfaced. And and the reason why we're choosing this, and then you kind of looked at the market, and you say you 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 look beside them, build an entire thesis around why you did what you did, right? So it's you build an onion in infinite ways. It's like it's why after why. You know, instead of asking why, you probably use more of the what's what drove you to do this, what and, and things like that, but. Uh, it took time. It took time, but I'm glad that we set a timeline. That that is the whenever it's like founders or folks are telling me like, "Hey, I'm trying to start a business or I'm trying to pivot," I just always tell them put a timeline because if if you don't put a timeline, you're going to be there forever, and and that could that could completely sink your career. Like, just make sure they no one that it's not easy, but like if you put yourself pressure in the same way that like. In corporate jobs, you have the artificial pressure of uh, deadlines. It pu- they push you, right? The, the reason why they exist mm-hmm. is because it helps you uh, uh, get to outcomes. Lots to unpack. Lots of questions going around in my head here. Um, but I think I wanted to start on, did you view, given this is a podcast about business failure, do you view your no. pivot as a failure? Because depending on how you span it, depending on how you essentially articulated it, do you think that that change of direction, which is essentially really two businesses, right? You've started one business, you've realized that there's actually better opportunity in a second idea, you've, and then you've essentially scrapped the first idea and taken the second idea, which... You know, you could view as the first idea kind of failed, or it was on the journey to failure, maybe. And then yeah. you've and then you started something better. So how how do you view it? Do you view it as a, a failure, or do you view it as something that is a kind of inevitable part of the startup journey? I th- I think it, yeah, it was a failure. I mean, obviously, like we recognize that the other business had, if anything, had a higher chance to fail than whatever the whatever we were looking at the opportunity today, right? Like risks are everywhere. Uh, what are you trying to maximize is your odds of success, right? Then I, I, obviously like it would take years to figure out if, I mean, it feels today that, that, that this is going to be a an awesome going concern in years to come, but we don't know, right? Like just even like 
behemoths of companies disappear after like 100 years of dominating dominating business right it's no visa and mastercard like even those businesses that like just seem unchallengeable end up sometimes uh, tripping but it did feel like a failure right it, it's hard right because you don't, you don't know necessarily your 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 stakeholders are going to buy in into the new idea it's not that easy right it's not that it's not your money right it's it, it's your investor's money to you also like need to sign customers and you, you need to be able to like convince customers to join are you going to was it a one hit wonder that you sign one to customers and is that motion going to translate them in more into more cells? All of those things cross your mind, right? So it's, and there's also the fear of failure on the other side, right? It's like, am I just rushing to make a decision uh, because I'm seeing this new shiny object and uh, and I'm just not fa- not like uh, holding to my guns? I mean, I, I can th- like the the idea the idea before this one it it got it became crystal clear to me that there were like new challenges coming in, right? Like aside from the fact that, the, that there was this new opportunity, the rate environment completely changed or was in the process of changing, right? As, infl- as inflation all over the world kind of skyrocketed and, uh, and rate and, and central buying banks started raising rates. I saw it, right? Like uh, lending is going to become more scarce and folks are going to start being rejected for loans because or like they're not going to start getting offers that are not as attractive for them or not as affordable so uh definitely if you're in the business of just lending and not not in the technology side because at the end of the day if you're with the technology you can make them more efficient and even if it's more expensive debt at least you can help the cost of origination go down but if you're at the top of the funnel in which you get paid by virtue of lending uh we saw that we saw that that, that that there was a frothing ass there, so um, recognizing that the the facts had changed and kind of like what Kane said, right? When the facts changed, I changed my mind. I think uh, uh, we were not rushed to to like make the. That's why we didn't rush ourselves because we 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 kind of wanted to see a couple more cards, but uh, I think that. From a de-risk standpoint, we did exactly what you had to do, right? Like, like, not care about what all what all the people would think, but really care about what you think is the best uh, use of the you know, best, like risk management and like kind of asset allocation you can do at that point. But in plain words, yeah, imagine that uh, we the original idea was in a course that was probably not going to be as and of course, the success that was not as clear anymore. What do you think? How do you think that would have played out if you'd kept that business? I think that I think it, it would still be around, um, but uh, I, I think it would have run into some headwinds, probably more headwinds than like we are, even were able to see when we were making the decision. Such, such as uh, it, the markets dried up even more right like the credit market so just became as a, the fed rate raised rates at a much faster pace than people were anticipating in early 2022 we also didn't anticipate the war right like just massive uh, oil shock in the summer of 22 i mean but you, you i guess you could read the headlines but um obviously there there's a billion other things going through your mind uh and i i would say those two things were big macro headwinds that 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 at that point were not as uh slam dunk of a on as a, of a forecast on our do you think starting that um that direct to consumer business at the beginning do you think there's anything that you missed that you know you could have anticipated and you know so you didn't have to essentially start the first business you could have gone straight into the to the second was yeah was did you make any wrong assumptions i think that's what i'm you know maybe going i mean uh, i think like it, it any business has like unique moments in time right like when when you can you have an opportunity where when i think about companies like for example remote.com or deal right what they do is international payroll uh yeah it had, had the pandemic not happened 
those companies would not be as successful, right? Like they're amazing companies, right? But it, it really does help that you have a once in a hundred year it's happening and then like all of a sudden people work uh, from wherever they want, right? Then like they have not returned to work. They, there were some, uh, I think that there were some risks that we were trying to mitigate. I think that the just things that move uh, at a certain pace and um, what, what we were, what I'm happy is that I, I don't think we would have ever unearthed the market that we operate in today had we actually not gone there direct to consumer first. Honestly, like the piece of technology that we build it's kind of obscure, right? Like you, you never, you probably would have never heard of loan origination system unless you were a banker, a credit union leader, a finance company. And we just discovered this as kind of like this engine that was part of our our entire stack, right? We just didn't know how important how important it was in the in in, in the entire business process, right? So although like to direct the consumer, the more and more I think about it, it, it was kind of like a means to an end, right? That we actually discover where we are today and kind of luckily uh, unearthed this new opportunity, right? Like it was, it, it, it was, it was a combination of a lot of effort and luck, but I, I yeah, I don't think most people come and run into like the, the idea of building a long regeneration system just as the first idea, no, it's, really not. it's just too, is it, yeah, just too narrow uh, of a subset of things. They just, yeah, people are thinking about curing cancer, right? Like things that affect them every day. And and I think direct to consumer uh, brands in general are like the first thing that come, comes to mind, right? And like some of the biggest companies in the world are like not direct to consumer. What do you think about like Salesforce and Oracle? And mm-hmm. I don't know, like just a, this a massive software businesses. Uh, that you never heard of, right? Like, unless you're very into in the wheat. Yeah, it's interesting what you said that you felt that in order to start this business, this your current business, that you needed to go through that journey. And obviously that's a, I, I suppose, you know, I have a lot of people on this um, this podcast who, who talk about the necessity of their previous failures in order to have shaped them and given them experience and learning to where they are now. And that sounds like it's a, you know, in, in some ways a comparative narrative to what you've been through. Yeah, yeah. I think like failure shapes you, right? It, it, it enables you to, I mean, it could totally turn into Pablo Dog too, right? That you're completely just terrified by failure. You just don't want to do anything. <laughs> you just give up but uh, i think uh for me like how the failure it's all about how you react to them right it's like oh my god we're gonna fail and it's like okay this could fail and how what type of guardrails what can we do now to ensure we succeed right how do you do risk what is your action plan to the risk right and then in our case like the action plan was like well actually we need to Turn ourselves into a different company. Like that's, um, and there's a, a, a plethora of cases, right? Like the, uh, of companies that you probably know today that you have no, that started as completely different businesses, right? Like Y Combinator has entire playbooks around how to pivot, what the process should be, right? Like it's, it's a very common thing to happen in business. The thing is to embrace it, to accept it, and 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 just and essentially execute on it. But was it hard for you? Did you feel like it was a failure at the time? Did you feel that you had kind of wasted your time and that you had the idea that that was kind of like quite personal to you, right? It was in the auto finance yeah. industry. You've got the influence of yeah. your, you know, your family and your love of, you know, motorsports as a young, you know, as a young child, you've gone all in on this um, industry that you've got a real passion for. Did you, did yeah. that really get to you? I think it would have been pretty hard had we actually not completely steer the, the ship. I, 
that I, I think we have a happy ending and that's why I think I'm lucky to have this perspective but I, I do recognize that had it had it not ended the way it ended I think it would have been very hard I, and, 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 and I can only imagine because I haven't gotten to the full point of like just sending the, the ship to the bottom of the ocean um, I can only imagine how hard that is right and knock on wood that at least for so far uh, it's only been like like a close call versus an actual thing the I I did think about in my head how would that play out right and it's not a nice mental place to be right and you 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 all you 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 have the oldest dreams that you ascribe to like you start like visualizing yourself and they're like oh this is going to be this and then it's not and you're like I'm gonna fight for for this vision to continue alive right and um, but I also play with the idea, I'll tell you with the idea of not happening. And I think what gave me peace of mind was, I, I go back to the sending the timeline, right? It's like, if it's not going to work, I'd rather just know a timeline for it so I can just continue with my life. And and I'm sure that as every other hard things in life, as long as it ends at one point, you can re restart and do like whatever the next thing is. Uh, you just become very excited about the next thing. I mean, one of the best, probably the, one of the best examples, uh, aside from, of course, like death and like things that are like just completely scarring, uh, it's think about all the people, uh, they, uh, unless you like former partners, right? How are you alive? Like they really matter at some point, and then you just wish them well. And I think like uh, your professional life is kind of like that too, right? Like, at some point, if it doesn't work, you just go to the next job. You wish them well, but just you, there's they yeah, have things that they have to worry about. You have they have you have things to worry about, right? And, and I'm sure that in a few years, I would have just been fine again. Um, same with going back to the immigrant story. I'm I, I'm not thinking all the time about like how much all the hardship in Bolivia at some point. It's like it was just a part of the story, right? Like. At the end, of, you end up kind of living in a mindset of like today, and of course, as an entrepreneur, you can look a little bit forward. But that that's one of those things that the, the human mind has, at least for most of us, that we're able to kind of move on. Not all of us, but it, on average. So it what it didn't really feel like, you know, your dream business had been kind of taken away from you. It was. It was. No, I, I wanted to build a business. I, I didn't necessarily. It's like my business. My dream was not to build uh, that. I wanted to build a business that I felt proud of that would outlive me. I didn't necessarily feel that I had to. I mean, kind of like the founding fathers of the U.S. Like they wanted to build an idea of a country. They didn't necessarily wanted to build like Virginia or Massachusetts, right? Like it was. There's this. We're going hodgepodge of nations or states. I felt the same way. Like I wanted to. I want to build a business with my co-founder. I, I, I think that one of the things I'm learning a lot with him. I have fun with him. Like a lot of the customers we already had were going to be our customers in the next business. So it felt to me like this is going to be resemble a lot of what is today. Uh, and it's just changing some of the dynamics, but I didn't, it, it didn't feel to me that it was like a, uh, it, it didn't have to be that. It's I I don't I didn't want to be num the number nine player on like Barcelona. I like I wanted to play sports, right? Kind <laughs> of like the general thing, and I wanted to be the best, a, a very good athlete in any category. And I think like for me, like I wanted to build a business and and and, and excel at it, right? If it had to be healthcare or finance, for me it was more like just the personal challenge of building a business that I lived, right? That like. My generations of my family hopefully can still like benefit from the fruits of it. So it's it, it was a different thing. Um, not sure if that answered no, where I was there. Was there any negative impacts from making this decision? I mean, probably like the natural one is that you, you part ways with people, right? So that has an impact on them. Um, I think what you what you need to like humanize that entire process and like just elevate it to like to that entire 
pro- to like the consequences that it carries, right? So you need to be capable to like put uh, put them in a position that they're going to find a new solution or an, a new position for their jobs. That that's probably the hardest part, like without a doubt. Uh, those are the ones that are actually affected, right? Because I think all the other parties uh, are a little more hedged, right? Whereas well, your employees are the ones that like suffer the consequences the most. So how did you approach that? How did you approach like laying them off I, in a sense? I, we, ex- we, we, you explain first and foremost what's happening, right? It's uh, then the, you explain to them this is where the direction we're going. You first communicate that you're considering this, right? So so folks know, hey, like this, there might not be a this position might not be available in the future, right? So you first de-risk that for them and let it sit in their minds. Um, and then uh, when, and you keep them updated, right? Like this is how, this is the ideas of evaluating. This is the timeline of which we're thinking about it. Um, and, uh, and and then I, you can have individual conversations with them. What, how are you thinking about their role? How does that fit in the future? And, and when the time comes out, you, you, you need to kind of like um, to tell how it is, right? Like it's, this is not a decision that comes down to your talents or anything. It's just your organization priorities have changed and like whatever you were doing here before, it, it's not, it's not something we're going to pursue anymore. So we wish you the best. You have a, a clear kind of, uh, uh, process of, uh, let, letting the people kind of transition, a transition that like enables them to like get into the, the next job in a way that you don't leave them on the call, so to speak, right? Like you're just a, all of this kind of yeah, enables them. But it's not an easy process, right? Like, especially for a startup, right? And it's not, we're not like Google, like where I give you five years of severance. I'm exaggerating, right? But it's one of those things that I think we all know going into startup that there's the risk of this, right? And just communicating that and looking at the face and like, I mean, there's always the example of folks that just did it via email, right? Like, just not humanize it. Just put a face, right? Like, just have the the courage to actually go and speak with a sense, uh, humanize that process. I think that people appreciate that more than you want anything. That like, that you care that you have the courage to like, just tell them the truth, right? Did you find those conversations hard? Yeah, of course. They're not easy. Not you don't look forward to that, right? But it's. Even when people, when you're letting go, someone go for cost, right? You don't enjoy that. I, it's, it, it's, it's, you, I think it will take a very different type of person to be like, oh, I, I'm going to fire people today and this is awesome. No, it's not, not an easy thing. But going back to like optionality and all those things we were, I was alluding to before, we get paid to make decisions, right? And like the, at the end of the day, I said, we need to keep the entire ship afloat, right? So you let, you, you, you let people go into the different careers with the hope that the rest of the, the people that stay, they are, have an opportunity to build an amazing career here too, right? Like it, it's just, you, you need to realize like, we need to make decisions here so that the entire, the, the larger ship can actually survive, right? So it's part of that. You need to make tough calls and, and. And if you don't, if you don't want to make decisions, then you shouldn't be a founder. And what, what, what I'm always fascinated by decision making. What, what, how do you approach making decisions, particularly difficult decisions? What process do you normally go through? I, I, I've had boss in the past, and I think like that. A framework that I like is first you identify the problem, right? Then you, you, you then you kind of, I, uh flesh out what is the current solution that like is helping alleviate that problem and then you say okay this is how it's being solved today these are like three other ways i don't know, just an arbitrary number right but like a couple of other ways to 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 sol- solve them kind of uh say the three that you like and, and say like hey this is my recommended one but I'll, let me show you what the other paths are um because i thought about it and, and then probably you double click on why you're recommending the one you have and you know especially when you're 
recommending these to folks about you, right? Like at least it shows you that you thought that you had a recommended solution because nothing worse than showing up to someone and being like, there's a fire. Um, and I, okay, so what do you want me to do? Like, you just, or you just it, I think it's much better to be like, I have a bucket of water. I also heard the wind in this direction works. And I, t and, uh, I've heard, uh, I've heard, I've actually put a, there's a plan of like, actually I have, we, we don't have water is dry season. So we have shovels so we can just put a holes around like the fire and, and it's not going to spread at least. So what do you think? Right. That, that, that type of stuff is kind of like the framework that I, that I usually use. Excellent. Looking back at the pivot and, you know, kind of what came after and, you know, the difficult conversations you had to have with, you know, investors and, and, and letting staff go, what did you learn from that experience? That hopefully we don't, we are not in that position again, but if we have to, that we did the, the we run the process in a way that was tactful. I think people were very grateful on how we, then we treated them that we gave them um, the dignity of the process and all that. I think that's uh, the, the first day that you definitely don't want to be there again. But it's whole, it's it's going to you're going to have to let people go, but hopefully not because the business completely has to change. Um, hopefully, it's for other reasons. Uh, and and when people bet on you, uh, you owe them. You feel like you felt to them, right? Like that's kind of to your point of like when that business didn't work, it's people that decided to choose you over all their opportunities and it didn't pan out. So that was the hardest part, I would say. And did you ever get any investors that basically wanted their money back? No, not really. I mean, I'm sure they, some of them might've been uh, skeptical, uh, but None, no, nothing that I would say like, wow, like that. I think that, uh, we, we were pretty fair with them, right? Like, and, and we have very good investors still, uh, we, I think to convey in the timeline and telling them like, Hey, we're not in the business of just stay with the money or running, a, running a lifestyle business. And we also want to get to the truth. Mm. So, um, yeah. And so what do you think really convinced them to, to stay with you? I think they like the idea. I mean, I would like to say they like us as founders, but I think most importantly, just there was the momentum in the business, right? Like, uh, saying that they like us as founders is just, uh, a vanity metric. The real thing was the business had traction and that's in business that it's worth a lot. What traction were you able to share with them at that time then? We, we assigned a ton of customers at that point. So that, that really felt strong, right? Like there was a real pool in the business that, that, and, and I think we were pretty transparent around the process, right? Like the same way that I describe you, the decision making process of like paid solutions and everything we presented all that, right? Like we showed a lot, a lot of cards. It was not like we are doing this, uh, it's more, we recommend doing this and we, we would like, uh, uh, to pursue this uh, and kind of in like in a wedding right where you say unless someone opposes it we're doing it and we did it yeah got it I mean I think yeah as you say that that um that traction was important and obviously the idea together I think it's probably a, it was probably going to be a combination of all those things right um it would be interesting <laughs> to know or I mean it's hypothetical but like if you if you hadn't you know had the traction you know, would they have been as convinced if they, if the idea was, they sort of thought it was rubbish, then yeah, maybe it might've been a different outcome as well. Right. Yeah, of course. And that is the traditionally all those risks were in our head. Right. So it was on, it was on us to make the case that the business was good and like in the business to actually be good. Right. Like, but it was completely on us to, to make, make the case to them. Right. Like your, your investors have already under, underwritten you before, like you need to give them a lot of uh, reasons to believe again, and and I think that's kind of what took them to uh, pass the line. Do you think there's an element of luck here? Because I'm um, just they just sort of came to me like of course, yeah. and like because it's luck, it's luck. 
I, 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 you need to meet luck, right? Like you need, it's hard work preparation. And it's, there's so much luck. Of course I believe in luck. I mean, it's just, there's just so much chance that comes into this, right? Like I, I, I do, if anything, I, this, that the Socrates component of like, the only thing I know is I know nothing. It's the same thing. I think I, the more, as you age, you just realize how much, how little and little, just the amount of like unknown becomes infinite and any more infinite than just orders of magnitude of infinity higher. That's kind of what life is, right? And I think having the ability to recognize that, you, that yes, you, you contributed to that component, but like that luck played a, a role. And I don't know what size of it, like that. Uh, from a statistics standpoint, I, I'm not sure there's a way to measure that with like, a, but I I am sure that luck plays a very important role, and as uh, and as, as as we humans predict this more and more, as kind of our body of knowledge increases, I think we're going to realize that um, the luck is a the biggest contributor to the things that happen in our lives. Yeah, because obviously, you know, you've kind of stumbled across this idea and obviously you got some some feedback as a positive feedback from some customers, which gave you the, the a bit of momentum and um, and conviction to move it forward. Um, but I suppose the, the bit that isn't luck, luck is your decision making to move forward with it because, you know, essentially you were at a crossroads and you could have picked a different path. Yeah, there is, it's not a hundred percent luck, right? There's, there's definitely moments of the you influence, but, uh, I just wanted to just be very transparent about it. Yeah. I like where the, I said it earlier, right? Where the sum of efforts, right? It's not that I, I like in the jungle book that I'm mostly, and I was raised by, by the wolves. I was raised by a family that loved me, that bet on me, that like sacrifice themselves. I have been fortunate to have amazing friends, an amazing wife, uh, all those people that influence your life, right? Like it's not just Andres Klarich that did all of this. Like not at all. Like, it, it would be delusional. Unfortunately, though, I see a lot of people that think that they did it. <laughs> what the... and that's a yeah. That's a whole different conversation. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, are you kind of touched on it earlier? But. I wanted to know what advice you would give to new entrepreneurs about handling the fear of failure. That you're going to fail, so you might as well just fail on something that you really believe in. And that life is going to beat you up somewhere at some point. It's going to be in your love life, it's going to be your professional life, it's going to be somewhere you're going to have a huge disappointment. Right? Uh, you might as well just fail on something that, like, you're going to learn so much too that like you're not going to care about the failure component. I mean, or at least the the benefits. Then you're 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 going to be a a net better person after going through this. It's not for everyone. Don't. It's just not at all as as uh, fancy as it is. You do a lot of work that is be described. Just nothing should be beneath you. Right? Like you're going to be doing like random stuff. Stuff that you, if you have a regular corporate job, you probably don't even do today. Even if you're a junior at a junior level, right? Like, it's not a fancy at all. Like the the people you see on TV are the the, the one percent or or or, la or lower of folks that actually made it, right? Like most entrepreneurs just just have very normal lives, right? But they have the freedom of having built in and influence and have been having had the opportunity to like touch people's lives in a different way. It's not for everyone. Not everyone should be an entrepreneur. But at least, if you have that curiosity, uh, and and it's and it's a burning desire, it's an amazing, it's an amazing opportunity. And like, I'm glad that uh, I'm, I'm I'm hope that they take it that that this helps them if they're listening. No, that's great advice. So, kind of final question, and I always end on uh, this question. I think. I'm gonna have to rephrase it because it is kind of a little bit tricky given you you kind of made the pivot before you failed. But essentially, 
it's about thinking back to that failure point and would you erase that from happening now i suppose the question here is would you have erased that time and effort you spent on that first business from ever kind of happening never first and foremost you can go on the past right but you can reflect on the past but no i it, it shapes the way the person you are the, who you are and everything right and if you really think that everything is interconnected to the universe if i change anything in my life i wouldn't be enjoying my six month old baby at home right so the, he's the most important person in my life alongside my wife and it's very clear to me that I wouldn't change a piece of anything. It, it, it made it made me get it made me have this conversation today. Like, it, I can reflect on it so it doesn't happen again. Certain things, but in terms of changing, nothing. Amazing. That's a good uh, perspective to have. So we always end on a quick fire round. So this is short questions and um, short answers. So first question is: <laughs> failure is it's part of human life. What is your life's mission? Build something that uh, outlives me. What's one piece of advice that you'd want to give to other people on your deathbed? Cold man. <laughs> Name one habit that keeps you resilient. Uh, I make my bed every day. It's just like I start with like a. I like starting very clean. Like, I just starting like as if everything looks. It's like a random thing, but it just helped me get my mind pretty yeah, clean. I'm the same. If you could be immortal, would you take it? If I could be immortal? Yeah, that if you could be immortal, as in live forever. No. Why not? No. And unless all the people that I care about live with me, no. If you could swap your position and be another business person, who would you want to be? I love those folks that do like travel. I mean, uh, rest in peace, uh, Anthony Bourdain. Aside from all the troubles he had, like in terms of like mental health, he seemed to have like one of the best lives ever. Like that, I think it's it's hard to beat. Definitely. And who's one person you think I should have on as a guest? I can think of a lot of people that have gone uh, uh, failures. I'm not sure if they if I can out them, but. I said, there's, there's uh, most humans that I can think of. If it could be like someone famous, um, I think. But they've had a business failure, I would say, you know. Michael Lovitz. Michael Lovitz. Like, I mean, I don't know him, but uh, he, he single having one of those guys had a very public failure and he has had to turn around in his career. Perfect. So uh, that's a good recommendation. So, Andreas, where can people find you and connect with you? LinkedIn is the best way. I'm Andres Klarich, uh, and I will do my. I've had great mentors in my life, and I will do my best to return the favor. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for being here today and sharing uh, your you know fascinating story. Um, and yeah, really appreciate your honesty. Perfect. I appreciate it, Jess. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.